What did y'all think of that? <laughs> well, I thought it was fantastic, too. My name is Kenneth Hoffman. I'm the executive director of the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience here in New Orleans. Uh, so now let me uh, quickly introduce our panelists here. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Marcy. Well, raise your hand so they'll know who I'm talking about. Dr. Marcy cohen Ferris. Um, it was born and raised in northeastern Arkansas. Ferris's deep attachment to the study of place and the American South is rooted in her childhood. For over 40 years, she has studied, taught, and written about the South, largely through its foodways, material culture, and the Southern Jewish experience. As a professor emeritus in the Department of American Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Ferris is an editor for Southern Cultures, a quarterly journal of the history and culture of the U.S. South, and a project, um, and a project of the Center of the Study of the American South. She served as the Center's interim director from 2022 to 2023. Uh, she has taught many classes there. Uh, she's written many books. Um, and, and most uh, interestingly enough to me was that she was the project director for the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience in Jackson, Mississippi, and in Utica, Mississippi, when the museum was originally at the camp from 1991 to 1994. Next, we have Dr. Stuart Rockoff. Stuart Rockoff was born in Fort Worth and raised in Houston, Texas, and graduated from Wesleyan University with a BA in history. He received his PhD in U.S. history from the University of Texas at Austin with a special emphasis on race, immigration, and American Jewish history. He has taught courses in American and ethnic history at um, such schools as the University of Texas and Millsaps College and has published numerous articles and essays on Southern Jewish history. For 11 years, he served as the historian of the Goldberg Waldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life. In, 2013, in, in 2013, he became the uh, executive director of the Mississippi Humanities Council, one of the 56 state, state and territorial affiliates of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Next, we have um, Susan Levitas. Right, and Susan Levitas is a folklorist by training who has used documentary and feature films to capture unexpected facets of the cultural history of the American South. She directed and uh, she directed and produced films on the rich musical and cultural life of the South. In 2003, she produced Shalom Y'all, a documentary on the complex past and present of Jews in the American South, which you just saw. And then the star of our panel, of course, is Mr. Brian Bain. Brian is a Southern filmmaker born and raised in New Orleans. Since Shalom Y'all, Brian has been involved in bringing a docu-style storytelling and comedic tone to his career as a commercial director. He has worked with a broad range of clients, including Miller Beer, Denny's, Boston Market, Lowe's, Dairy Queen, CBS Sports, and many more. Please help me welcome our panelists. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna talk a little bit about uh, the film. We're gonna talk about what's happened uh, to the Southern Jewish experience over the last 20 years. And folks are gonna be able to share a little bit of their own experiences documenting documenting and studying that experience over the last 20 years. So I'll start by saying to, to Brian, thank you for making this film. It's a wonderful testament to exactly what the museum uh, is trying to express, to explore identities in the South. Tell us, if you would, what prompted you to make this film in the first place? Um, thank you. And thank you for for hosting. <laughs> um, so, you know, Shalom Y'all really came about through conversations with my grandfather who was in it, who it really, uh, it's amazing to see him on the big screen. Um, but, uh, you know, he used to tell us stories about traveling through the South and, and it really instilled in us a sense of curiosity, I suppose. And then just realizing the intersection of Judaism and being a Southerner was unique. 
it just sort of bubbled up from there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to ask the, the panelists, so I'm going to ask Marcy and Stuart um, to tell us what they think the importance of this film is for us today. Stuart? You got it first. Oh, okay. This film is so important to me. It's it's really a classic film. You know, I, I, I think it's got kind of cult status also, you know, Shalom Y'all, and I realized it came out at a really pivotal time for me. I mean, I've been involved in documenting and learning about and telling the story and learning the history of the Jewish South for most of my adult career. And this film was kind of at, at uh, you know, at the beginning of that as well, or at least when I I'd left the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience and was starting to teach at the University of North Carolina. And we started our Jewish studies program that very same year in 2003. And so I've always showed the film. It's still on my syllabus. I, I teach a class um, that is about race, religion, and region, focused on the American Jewish, on the Jewish South. And I'll do that this spring. And this film is really important. And, you know, we were talking before that I think it points to 20 years ago, well, Brian had kind of two babies, the film, and then also a baby baby. And, you know, so we were trying to kind of look at and think like so much has so much has changed, but it pointed to really nascent things that were happening in the region, you know, that have really come in that have evolved uh, and that we now see in a much more in, in, in much more detail today. But, you know, I just think it's it's a classic film. It captures a moment in time. There's been a, you know, a racial kind of reckoning and, uh, you know, revolution and so many things have happened. Uh, but we'll talk more about those. Yeah, thanks, Marcy. I mean, I think that it is a lovely synthesis of the subject. Um, and I love how you used Eli because Eli's book, The Provincials, sort of played a similar role as kind of a poetic overview. And so, yeah. Um, and so what's incredible is I, I saw the film several times when it came out. I've done these sort of panels like 20, 18 years ago with Brian and Susan in various places. But prior, prior to rewatching it, I talked with Marcy and thought, you know, what are some of the trends that have happened since then that, that probably aren't in the film? And I was struck by watching it like they were on top of stuff. So the growth of suburban Atlanta as the future of the 21st century Southern Jewish community, um, the increasing racial diversity of the Jewish community. Y'all had Ruben Greenberg in the film. And so, so it's both a lovely synthesis 20 years ago, but also in sort of many ways kind of remarkably prescient uh, about the trends that would continue and still shape us today. Thank you very much. Susan, tell us the story. Cast your mind back 20 years or more to how you and Brian came together to, to, have, to make this, uh, this movie. Um, I also want to thank the panelists so much for, for speaking about the film and really thinking about what's gone on in the past um, 20 years. So I uh, came down to New Orleans in the mid-90s. I was producing a feature film, but I was showing a documentary that I had made on African-American music traditions in Washington, D.C. called The Music District at the New Orleans Film Festival. And I met Brian there, and we just talked about projects we were working on, and he mentioned this thing he was working on called Shalom, y'all, and my mind blew because I'm a Southern Jew, and I was a documentary filmmaker. He already had a producer, however. They were already, they'd already sort of started on the path, and I thought, man, that just felt like, you know, meeting my, my um, silver screen soulmate. And I've lost the opportunity. Um, and then ran into him later and found that the producer had it had not worked out. Um, they were sort of at a stall and we got in I got involved in working with him. It was yeah, and um meant to be Brichert, right? And um because I grew up in Atlanta, uh, you know, some of the people from the Atlanta piece are my cousins, one's obviously my father of blessed memory. Um, and, um, and, you know, I had grown up in that, that community, which has changed quite a bit since I grew up, um, in the seventies. And it was really funny working with Brian and, and so fun, but it was funny because it, to him, anything North of the I-10 was not the South. 
I kept advocating for us to go to, you know, North Carolina. And he's like, but that's not the South. <laughs> so, it's got the word North. Right yeah, yeah, right in it, right. Uh, but anyway, so that's how, how uh, it began. And it was just like such um, a transformative experience in my personal life, but also my professional life to meet and work with Brian on this film, which um, was just so incredible to see today. Brian, I know that when films are made, a majority of the of the of the whatever it's called nitrate it's not nitrate anymore the, but the film winds up on the cutting room floor and the film probably could have been five hours long with everything that you recorded um what didn't make it into the film that that was the hardest to cut um that's a tough question um yeah we had 26 27 hours of footage and um, and we worked with amazing editors that kept chipping away at it. And um, we did a lot of focus groups, believe it or not, where we were asking people, like, what resonates with you? What feels important to you? And um, that was really meaningful and really helped shape the film in a lot of ways. Um, there, was a ama there was an amazing alligator fisherman, a Jewish alligator fisherman, down the bayou. And um, named Hyman Saltz, I think also a blessed memory. <laughs> and um, he was he was amazing. And unfortunately, I think it might be on the DVD in the bonus. If you own a DVD player, <laughs> it's in the bonus scenes. But um, we may add it at some point. Elvis's and oh right right oh George Klein, who was Jewish and Elvis's best friend, we filmed him at Graceland which was unbelievable. And, um, you know, he told this great story. Elvis used to wear a Jewish star and a cross, and he would tell people, uh, you know, I just, I don't want to miss out on getting into heaven on a technicality. <laughs> that was his, so. He bought his Elvis salt stroll where he came from Harry Levitch in Memphis. Really? Yeah, the Harry, Le Harry Levitch had a beautiful... Yeah, and, and, and Lansky's, he bought his clothes from. But just, Brian, related to the 26 hours of film and more, Susan, y'all, they donated the collection, the research collection, all their field notes, all those hours of video, all the photography, all the research y'all did on the film, which is really extensive. It's now in the Southern Historical Collection archive which is the at UNC, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So we're gonna be using that in my class. It's Much of it is digitized, of course, and it's just incredible. It's an incredible resource now to the study of the Jewish South and the research you've done. So it feels like to me it's come really full circle in that way that the archival collection behind that, that represents all the work that y'all did and also your your ownership of it, and also all the crew, you know, the the that were involved, um, is now another. It it's, it just it represents another moment in the evolution of the study of the Jewish South to have that record. So I'm so grateful to y'all. Susan, anything you uh, wish could have been in the film that wasn't? Um, well, like Brian said, there there are so many great things. I mean, I think there there was also we we did visit um, we did go to North Carolina. And um, we visited uh, the Cohen, the Cone, I think it is, uh, denim factory in Greensboro, North Carolina, which was, which was amazing. Um, uh, I think again, maybe on deleted or bonus scenes on a DVD. So, yeah, made they made Levi's jeans. Um, and we also went to um, the 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 guys who the Orthodox guys who had the seafood restaurant in. Um, Hyman Seafood, yeah. So and and so there were things. There were so many scenes like that. Really, I mean, standalone scenes that were incredible. But they didn't, as, you know, as filmmakers, we wanted to keep this to an hour and um, less is more. And some of the these scenes and some of these stories were redundant. They somebody else was was telling that bit of information that was propelling the story forward in a more um, uh, in in a, in a better way or in a different way. And so. Um, it was a tough call, but I think those two were scenes that I thought were particularly interesting um, from the standpoint of, of a factory, Jewish factory, and um, also, uh, you know, the kind of relationship between, you know, like observance, being Orthodox Jews, but 
running a seafood restaurant as a, but like Jack Crystal kind of represented a similar storyline. So that's why that got left out. Thank you. Uh, back to um, Stuart and Marcy. Uh, in the last 20 years, what, what has changed about the Southern Jewish experience? And you have 30 seconds. No, just, <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Let's start with Stuart. Go, go. Yes. Yes. Um, I think the South has changed. And our understanding of the South has changed. Um, you know, and there's some symbols of that that kind of jumped out to me during the film. One is Natchez, right? So um, I go to Natchez a good bit. And, you know, while Natchez 20 years ago really represented, you know, a kind of mythological old South, um, Natchez has changed a lot in how it's telling its own story. And so the notion of Southern Jews have to fit into that type of old white South mythology is different, and our understanding of the fact that in big parts of the South, uh, the South isn't white, right? Um, and so that's certainly true in Natchez. And so I think that our understanding of the South has changed, the South has changed, and I loved at the end when Brian used the Mississippi State flag, and I forget the, the term you used, it was sort of like a negative connotation of the South. And of course, that's no longer the Mississippi State flag, and I'm quite proud of that as a Mississippian. And so, so yes, yeah, Southern Jewish history has or Southern Jewish life has changed, sir, and um, certainly Marcy is going to elucidate on that. Um, elucidate on that, but to me, it struck me as how much the South and our understanding of it has changed. Yeah, that's really, really helpful to hear. Yeah, I think how we understand and tell these histories, the complexity, the difficulty, the trauma, the racism. You know, you know when when Jay. Uh, Lame, L Lehman, tell, Lehman tells the story about, you know, carrying the, the Confederate flag, you know, and that Confederate pageant. And, you know, we, at that point, you know, we just all kind of cringe now and, you know, and but really understand that kind of, you know, uh, reconstructed, uh, you know, remembering, you know, of this kind of white uh, past, remembered past. And, and we're, it's so generational, folks like Elaine, Lehman and where she fit and Bob as well they were you know they had a clothing store really lovely <laughs> and she says Jewish people they came from lovely people <laughs> lovely people and we you know and it's like it, there's a lot of coded language in this you know about class and about race and about country of origin but I always felt, because Kenneth and I, Kenneth did the research really on the Natchez congregation. Well, you did on the Port Gibson community, but you also helped us with the Natchez project. Kenneth was an intern, my intern at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. I'm so proud of him. <laughs> He's now, it's so amazing. Had he had hair. <laughs> he had hair. And so we were, we were documenting, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Gemming Lithkasset in Port Gibson and then also celebrating the long history of the Natchez congregation. And it was somewhat of a little struggle with, with Elaine at the time because she ha felt like, she didn't say it, but you could s understand that in her 70s, she, they had, it was the classic, here are you out Jewish outsiders, almost like civil rights worker, Jewish civil rights workers who'd come into the South in the 60s and 70s from the North and ha had a lot of resistance from Jewish members of congregations that said, you're going to rock the boat, and we need to just be as quiet as possible, and protect, you know, pr this is a very dangerous time. You could still feel that sense of danger and vulnerability and fragility that Elaine felt in that congregation. It didn't have anything to do with the fact that they were just eight members. It had still always been that way, that they were very careful um, and they were they had the kind of liminal whiteness, you know, accepted. And and when push came to shove, you know, they they were they, uh, there were forty merchant Jewish merchants in Natchez at one time. So yeah, they were fairly well accepted. And also because Jane Wexler Stein was one of the first pilgrimage queen. queen. Yeah. And I remember Lane saying she never looked that good again. <laughs> It's a very, ju very Jewish. She looks so good then, yeah. but uh, yeah, she did look good. 
excuse me. And she did. I just, because I thought that, you know, I was like, Elaine, don't say that, because yeah. that is a fabulous photograph, and it's just an incredible history. But it really talks about, you know, that the agency that Jews had in Natchez, that they were part of that pilgrimage garden club. And what that thing was, was, was a response to raising money in a, in a depression era in Natchez, uh, that was the you know economy was really really flat and how were they gonna you know try to bring some business back to Natchez and that was through tourism. One quick, um, and what's amazing is that is that that Natchez congregation is still open. Um, they probably have a few fewer, a few fewer, somewhat fewer members, but they still hold services not regularly but once in a while. And what's remarkable is. When they hold services, there are probably more non-Jews in the sanctuary than Jews. Um, there are a lot of people in Natchez who really treasure that congregation and are helping to kind of keep it active uh, as best it can be. But it's still, you know, very, very small, but 20 years later. I think some of the most uh, profound statements in the film maybe came from Eli Evans who we recently lost in the last, in the last few years, a couple of years, um, really the patron saint, if we can say that for Jews, of uh, p poet, poet laureate, poet laureate of so the Southern Jewish experience. Um, uh, he grew up in North Carolina. His father was the mayor of Durham, five-time elected mayor of Durham, North Carolina, um, and wrote some wonderful um, both histories but also personal remembrances of, uh, of being Jewish in the South. And, and, and one of the things he said that I wrote down because I thought it was really interesting, well, two things. One, he says, there's no holy book on how to be Southern. So that's interesting because there's a lot of different kinds of Southerners. Texas is different from Virginia, is different from Florida. Um, but he also said Judaism is something uh, you can take with you around the world. Southern is an identity tied to place. And I'm wondering, Susan, if you have anything to say about that dichotomy. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting, I have to say, to watch a film like this um, 20 years on and in the kind of political context we're in right now, because uh, there's so much conversation around place and attachment and um, identity. Um, I think that it... But but to speak more directly, so so that's just struck me as I've watched the film, and also just to your point about the kind of reckoning that we've thank thankfully gone through, things have shifted. It's it's very weird to watch some of this now um, because we were the children of people who were also trying to get by and so-called pass as white. Um, but I mean, just from a personal perspective. I didn't realize the kind of um, fervor with which Southern Jews, especially in smaller towns, um, felt around their attachment to place until I took this trip. Because, yeah, you know, I did grow up in Atlanta, which already even then had, a, you know, a lot of Jewish congregations and more, you know, yeah, maybe we were the second Jews to move into our neighborhood, which is now flipped and is completely Jewish. But um, we we didn't feel like Jack Crystal did, or or you know people in smaller towns. So that was very impactful to me personally to sort of see um, in these places throughout the South where people felt um, in incredibly either afraid or welcomed, or just in general over time and over generations attached to place in a way that I, as a folklorist I hadn't seen. Um, as I traveled around different parts of the country. So there was th this was something that I, we talked about a lot. What is this Southern thing? There is no handbook. But what is this essence, this sort of thing that had been defined by the rest of the country, this idea in the cultural imagination, but also this thing that was embraced um, by Jews across the religious spectrum. And um, it, it was a th an essence, a thing that especially felt strong uh, in smaller parts of the South. I don't know how I got the mic, Brian. Don't you? <laughs> um, 
That's a really good point, Susan. And it, it sort of struck me how, so what's changed is that we've seen further continuation of, you know, um, um, of the trends. Smaller Jewish congregations and communities have, have shrunk or closed. Um, the places in the South that are growing population-wise, Nashville, Charlotte, Atlanta, Austin, um, are by and large seeing tremendous growth in their Jewish communities. But those small town Jewish communities, I think, are tremendously significant. And I want to tell a story to prove that point. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I was up in a town called Lexington, Mississippi, about an hour north of Jackson. And they were doing, a local historical society was doing a tour of historic churches. And we had a little bit of funding in there, the Humanities Council. So I went, and the tour was uh, a white Methodist church, a black AME church, and the Jewish synagogue that hadn't had a service since 2009. And so there was, there was one Jewish family left in Lexington. They sold the store on the square, Cohen's. This is Phil Cohen. Um, and yet, 15 years after the closing of that synagogue, when they thought about what are the historic religious structures in our community, that Temple Bethel was part of the tour. And so even when the last Jewish person moves away or passes away in Lexington, there is a sense that that presence um, made the South a more diverse place that helped people understand religious diversity. Doesn't always stick and all things like that. But if you multiply that one example times the hundreds of small town synagogues in the South and beyond, what these small communities did is they made Judaism part of America's religious mainstream, right? Not just in the major cities. So I think that's, y'all captured that very well in the film. But one thing Stuart was saying too, that the growth that we're seeing in cities even like near us, Durham, North Carolina, incredible growth in its Jewish community, much younger, also COVID related, uh, a lot of um, in you know people moving during COVID, seeking you know maybe a better quality of life, thinking they could find that in Durham, and I understand that, and that really hit home when Bill and I were invited. My husband Bill is here as a folklorist too, Susan. And we were invited to have lunch during Sukkah uh, and to, it, to, with a, a wonderful professor, uh, literary uh, professor and writer, Joseph Skybell from Atlanta, who's just fantastic. He teaches at Emory, and he had come over to, to, to be with his daughter. He just had a child. And so they're observant. He grew up in Texas, you know, Jewish, uh, you know, not so observant there, but has really become so. Spent a lot of time in Israel as well. And so we ate outside, of course, outside in the sukkah booth and uh, for Sukkot, and it was just beautiful. And I looked across the street, and there was another Sukkot uh, you know, uh, another sukkah booth right across the street. And I'm like, wow, it's like we're in a little Jewish ghetto or something in Durban. You know, we were in a young neighbor, a, a young neighborhood. So you can really feel, feel that change. Yeah, that vibrancy is really, is really happening. So we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to end this because there this was so popular this event that there is a six o'clock screening that was added so we're gonna need to close it up so I'm gonna say something and then I'm gonna give it to Brian to 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 end uh, another Eli Evans thing that I loved was when he said I always say this is a braided experience it's like the challah the challah is a twisted experience but all the bread is one thing. Um, and at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience, when young people come in on field trips, we do an activity with them where we talk about identity and what is your identity. And you actually have many identities all twisted together to make you. Um, and that's what we're trying to show, that it's okay to have different identities. It's okay to explore different identities, to understand your neighbors or strangers' different identities. That's the universal lesson that the museum is trying to show. And I think this film does a very good job of doing that as well. I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. He's gonna, he's gonna close us out. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody again for coming out. It's crazy that it's been 20 years, first of all. And, um, and just, uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that it still resonates with your students. And, um, and the people sitting up here were so, they have their fingerprints on this film from the beginning, really, each and every one of you in some way. And, um, and I, I, right, we're, I'm still married. Julie's here. 
Julie, come up here, <laughs> say hi. Um, when we were in New York, uh, and and yeah, and Susan met Jake at a shalom because of shalom, y'all. So there you go. Uh, but seriously, um, no, they they we really Amy and I who di Amy did an amazing job planning this. Thank you so much. Um, we really um, I felt like it was important for you guys to be here um, because the landscape has changed somewhat. And I really felt like your voices uh, resonated beautifully today. So thank you for being here. And thank my parents. Hey, mom and dad. <laughs> and my brothers and their wives and nephews and other relatives. The mishpucha. Yeah, go to the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. We'll be around afterwards to visit.